Welcome to SCOTUS Cast, Design Patents and Smartphone Wars Edition. Thank you for tuning in. On October 5th, 2016, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in Samsung Electronics Company v. Apple. In April 2011, Apple sued Samsung Electronics, alleging that Samsung's smartphones infringe on Apple's trade dress as well as various design patents for the iPhone. A jury awarded Apple nearly $1 billion in damages, and the trial court upheld most of the award against Samsung's post-trial challenges. On appeal, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit rejected Samsung's argument that the district court erred by allowing the jury to award damages based on Samsung's profits off of its phones in their entirety, rather than just the portion of profits attributable to the smartphone components covered under the design patents. The question now before the Supreme Court is whether, where a design patent is applied to only a component of a product, an award of infringer's profits should be limited to those profits attributable to the component. To discuss the case, we have Mark D. Janis, the Robert A. Lucas Chair of Law and Director of the Center for Intellectual Property Research at the Marr School of Law, Indiana University. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. And now, Professor Janus. The Apple versus Samsung litigation at the Supreme Court has taken an extraordinary turn in recent weeks. Both parties recently have conceded away hard-fought, long-held positions and have stampeded, I would say rather wildly, uh, toward a supposed middle ground. And that kind of development is not actually as laudatory and constructive uh, as it might sound, and here's why. Uh, the middle ground isn't really in the middle at all, and I believe that that's the real story of this case as it goes forward. Uh, so I'm going to explain briefly why I say that and why I continue to see this case as presenting actually a simple statutory construction issue for the Supreme Court to resolve and why that's so even if many of us might also conclude that Congress ought to consider amending the statute that is in front of the Supreme Court for construction. So let me briefly recount these recent developments. Until recently, the central issue presented by the parties in this iteration of uh, the Apple versus Samsung litigation was how to apply the phrase total profits in the special remedies provision for design patent infringement, which is section 289 of the patent statute. Apple had argued that total means total, even as applied to multi-component articles uh, having valuable technical features in addition to design features. Samsung, on the other hand, had argued that total could mean partial because not all of the profits on an infringing multi-component article were necessarily attributable to the design features, and this is an argument commonly referred to as an argument for apportionment of damages. So enter the U.S. government in the form of an amicus brief uh, filed on behalf of neither party. The government uh, as amicus argued that total did in fact mean total, thereby disagreeing with Samsung's apportionment argument. But the government also argued that in cases involving multi-component articles, to a profits might be calculated based on a component of the article and thereby disagreeing at least to some extent with Apple's position. In offering this second argument, the government relied on the language article of manufacture in section 289, and it suggested a rather complicated multi-factor test for uh, determining what the relevant article of manufacture would be. Uh, and among other things, that test uh, would look to the design patent in, des in determining the relevant article of manufacture. It would also look to the uh, relative prominence of the design in the whole of the article. So this was, on the part of the government, a remarkable effort, I would say, to claim the middle ground. And both parties 
quickly gravitated toward it. At oral argument, Samsung announced that it was giving up its argument uh, as to total profits, uh, giving up its apportionment argument, at least in that regard, and embracing the, the article of manufacture analysis. Apple, uh, on its part, conceded that total profits indeed might be calculated based on components of multi-component devices, although it said that Samsung had waived that issue. And virtually all of the court's questions at oral argument centered on this article of manufacture analysis. So why do I insist that this is not middle ground and this is not uh, necessarily a constructive development? And these are some arguments that uh, I raised previously before the court in an amicus brief uh, that I and a colleague filed on behalf of a group of uh, intellectual property law professors. And, and the answer is uh, based on the relevant language of Section 289, this special uh, remedies provision. It says, whoever, in relevant part, whoever during the term of a, a design patent without license applies the patented design to any article of manufacture for the purpose of sale shall be liable to the owner to the extent of his total profit, uh, but not less than $250. It uses the phrase total profit, and it uses the phrase any article of manufacture. And my problem with the direction that the case has gone is that just like uh, Samsung's apportionment argument that's now been conceded away, this article of manufacture analysis that's been proposed by the government contravenes the statutory text, it contravenes the logic of the statute, it's not compromise middle ground. It actually facilitates an analysis that, analysis that I believe is the equivalent of the very apportionment methodology that, that Samsung uh, purported to give up. So briefly, anyway, why do I say this? Well, first, with regards to the statutory text, the statute is clearly referring to the alleged infringer's article of manufacture, not the patentee's article of manufacture. And the statute imposes liability for applying the patented design without license to any article of manufacture for purpose of sale. This language calls into question, at the very least, calls into question the proposition that the article uh, identified in the design patent should be a principal factor for determining what constitutes the relevant article of manufacture for Section 289 purposes. It should be the infringer's article of manufacture. So just to provide an example, in my view, if I have a design patent on the Statue of Liberty, which actually was the subject of an old design patent, and someone else without authority were to make a Statue of Liberty clock or a Statue of Liberty set of diamond earrings, in my view, Section 289, as it presently exists, should give me total profits on the clock or on the earrings, assuming that infringement's been found, and it should not be relevant to the damages inquiry that the article of manufacture that is, uh, that is identified in my patent is a design for a statue, or as it said in the actual patent, a design for a bust. The fact that the infringing articles are something different from that should not matter for purposes of the damages inquiry. So that's one problem. Another problem and a problem that illuminates the, the reason that I say that this is not really middle ground is that I think that the government's uh, proposed factors test is a backdoor invitation for courts to engage in the very sort of apportionment that Samsung was had been pushing for all, all along. That's why I say this is not middle ground. Another reason I say this is not middle ground. And so if you think about that in, ter in, in the context of the, the logic of the statute, what the government and now Samsung is saying is that under the guise of interpreting the statute, the government and Samsung are saying that the that Congress, in writing this statute, slammed the door shut on an apportionment argument by including the phrase total profits. 
but then left the door wide open by including the phrase article of manufacture. To me, this does not sound like statutory interpretation. And I don't think it's an answer also to suggest that this sort of question about the article of manufacture will only uh, be implicated in a very small number of hard cases. I think actually in application, everything is going to be argued to be a multi-component article that is subject to this test and that it will be very routine for litigants to have to engage in very elaborate arguments at the damages phase about what the article of manufacture is. So I think that's problematic. And lastly, I would say that these arguments that I've been making are arguments about statutory construction and about judicial restraint. And, uh, you know, my bottom line, as you can tell, is that this is actually a pretty simple matter of statutory construction because the statute says very clearly total profits and it says very clearly any article of manufacture. And I think the court could resolve the case by saying the statute means what it says. That is not the same as arguing that the statute as it is currently constituted is the best way to the best rule for design patent remedies. Um, I think that there are important policy considerations that the court would leave unresolved if the court were to proceed in the manner that I suggest. But I think that those policy considerations are uh, matters uh, left that, that ought to be left for Congress, and I think that Congress is best suited to consider them comprehensively. And, and just by way of conclusion, I'll, I'll give you a few reasons for that. Congress is in the best position to take account of the varying needs of the many diverse industries that might be affected uh, by a ruling on design patent remedies. Congress is in the best position to take into consideration the eclectic nature of the design patent system, which draws from copyright, it draws from trademark, it draws not just from utility patent rules, which are the origin of the apportionment analysis. And finally, Congress has the luxury of taking the 10,000-foot view. And when you take that point of view, you, you begin to realize, I think, that this, this statutory provision has two components. One component is the total profits part. The other component uh, provides a minimum set statutory amount of damages. Uh, Congress, when it originally wrote the statute, I believe thought that that statutory minimum amount of damages actually was very important because at that time uh, there was no reasonable royalty rule in patent law guaranteeing a minimum amount of damages. So I think Congress really thought that many cases in design patent would actually turn on that part of the provision and not on the total profits prong. And indeed, early on they did. But as you might have heard when I read it, that the, the statutory minimum is $250. That sounded great in 1887 when the act was passed. It doesn't sound so great today. Congress is in the best position to revisit this statute comprehensively, to put into place a meaningful statutory minimum, and thereby take the pressure off this very complicated total profits analysis. And that would be a good uh, uh, task for Congress to take up. It's not an appropriate task, in my view, for the court to take up under the guise of, of statutory interpretation. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. For more episodes of SCOTUScast, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at www.federalistsociety.org slash multimedia.